proficient ministry on this campus, and we, we we aim to create a safe place for people to explore their faith and to have relevant teachings that people can apply in their lives to help them go through this transitionary period. Uh, and tonight we have the honor of having a very good friend of mine and a mentor of mine, Tim Riley, here to speak for us. Uh, years ago on a night just like tonight. It was the first Thursday night of the semester, and I came as a little punk trying to argue with him, thinking that I could outsmart this guy. Uh, and then I ended up uh, reading a 2,000-year-old book on a park bench every Friday for a uh, whole semester. And then he dumped me in a bath of water. And if you don't know what that's about, well, you're going to find out tonight. So here's my friend. <laughs> How are you guys? <laughs> Back to school. Hey, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles. If you have one, paper Bible, open it up to the middle. Go to the right. We're going to be in John chapter 1. If you have a Bible app, feel free to go to it. If you don't have a Bible app, just turn your phone on silent and just text. That's totally fine. So, go to your Bible app. And we're going to be talking, as we've been, uh, as Keith just shared, there is this this idea that we are something, I am blank anonymous. And tonight we're going to talk about the fact that you are not alone. And I was thinking of a Michael Jackson song when I say that. Anyone? Just me? Okay. Right. So now it's going to be stuck in your head. You're welcome. You are not alone. You are known. And so, uh, for as the start of the school year, some of you are freshmen, you're coming onto this campus, your eyes are very big, you don't really know who people are. It's kind of a messed up situation because so many of us have come from high school where we were the seniors, we were the big fish in a small pond, everyone knew who we were, we were the oldest, and then we get dumped into college for our freshman year and we don't know anyone. And people are trying to buy for our attention, they want to talk with us, they want to spend time with us and we're not really sure what they're selling. And so my hope is, as we study the book of John, we're going to go through John chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. My hope is that in this time that you would just, no matter what you brought into this place, maybe you don't believe in God, maybe you were just told there was going to be free tacos, maybe you've been a Christian your whole life, which is impossible. Maybe you have gone to church your whole life, but you've never really experienced the fact that you are not alone and you can be known by God. And so my hope is that as we engage in the Bible, that you would actually spend time listening, as Keith said, this 2,000-year-old book, that you would spend time, it's actually a lot older than that technically, Keith, um, but you would spend a lot of time looking at this book and seeing how can this actually inform my life? How can I read this book? How can I spend time in it and actually know a God who created me and loves me and knows me and knows every hair on my head? So before we really jump into it, what I'd love to do is I'd love to just pray. So if you're not familiar with praying, if you don't really pray on your own, would you just sit silently where you are? If you're comfortable with praying, would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads and just listen as I pray? And if I say anything that you, you respond to or you care about, would you just say amen? God, we pray that tonight would be a night that would encourage each one of our souls, that we would spend time in your word, and it wouldn't be so much that we would read it, but God, would you read us? Would you allow this time to be a time that changes hearts, and as we hear about exactly who this God is who knows us, that we would engage with you, God, that you would change our hearts, that you would allow us to know our Creator in a special, vibrant, experiential way. We thank you for what you're going to accomplish tonight. And we thank you that you love us in spite of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So John chapter 1, it's in this Bible. And for a lot of us, we don't really understand what this book is. Like, do you understand what this book is? You can talk back. White people, you can write notes. That's how you say amen. But for the rest of you, do you understand what this book is? Do you understand that this was written over 1,500 years and it was written on three different continents by 40 different authors, all writing 66 different letters that told one story about Jesus Christ, all penned by the Holy Spirit of God. Do you understand this book? Do you care about this book? Does this book matter to you? Do you know who Abraham is and how he plays a role in our salvation story? Do you know who Habakkuk is? Have you heard of Jeremiah? What are you going to do in heaven one day when you run into Isaiah and you're like, hey, bro? Um, yeah, I didn't have time to read your book. Uh, do you know where John is? I really love that one verse in his book. What are you going to do? Do you know this book? Do you understand it? Do you understand how it can inform our lives? 
So, as we start in verse 1 of John chapter 1, just for context perspective, if you're familiar with the Bible, there's four different Gospels in here. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means to be seen together. Then you have the book of John. John was written to a specific religion in the time period, about 2,000 years ago, who is starting to say that Jesus didn't rise physically, but he rose spiritually. And so throughout the book of John, you see John be very specific that Jesus ate with them after his death and resurrection, that he touched them, that people touched him. And he's very specific because he wants people to know that Jesus was as much alive before his death as after his death, that he physically rose from the dead. So everything Jesus, John writes is to point people towards that truth. So here we go, John chapter 1. And if you're not familiar with how, at least I do this, but a lot of teachers do this when they teach the Bible, we're going to read a verse, and then we're going to talk a little bit. And then we're going to read a little bit, and then we're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to eat more tacos. Amen? Woo! Yeah. Right. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Anyone confused? Think about this. When we talk about trying to tell people about Jesus, this, this word is called evangelism. We want to share with people and proclaim and declare that Jesus is Lord. But generally, what do people do? We'll just have them read the Bible. Where should they start? Start in John chapter 1. But the first verse says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's confusing. And we need to start to understand that God has given us a voice. God has allowed us to start to understand the scripture through the power of his spirit, through the willingness we have to engage in this word so we can teach others. Don't just give the Bible to someone and expect them to figure it out. John parallels Genesis chapter 1. If you're not familiar where Genesis is, it's in the very beginning of the Bible. It's the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, written by Moses via the Holy Spirit. And in that it says, in the beginning, God. And here it says, in the beginning was the Word. And there's this parallel because as we continue to go through this, these next few verses, we start to see that the Word plays a huge part in our lives. That the Word is not just a Word that means Word, but it's capital W, and eventually, as we see in verse 14, that the Word became flesh, and He walked amongst us. So here, John is explaining that from the beginning, Jesus has been. That he walked among us. The word logos means truth. In the beginning was the truth, and the truth was with God, and the truth was God. Logos, the word, means logic. The truth or the word is that Jesus existed. He was not created. He's always existed, and that's where John starts, because we need to understand that Jesus was just not someone who was made up. He wasn't just someone who was born to Mary. He has always been God, and he's always existed. It was God who brought creation into existence, and John is using this terminology as the word because in this context, both Jew and Greek would both understand the word that was being used, the word. Verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. So you start in verse 1, it's already a little confusing. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. What? Like, this is confusing if you're not really familiar with this text. He, being Jesus, was with God. But isn't he God? So are we telling two different stories? See, Jesus is the Son. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, all doing their duty. All doing the thing that they are supposed to do. But they're all one God. One God, three persons. See, the Trinity, that's what they call this it's very hard to understand, and many people will just start to argue with it because it's not specifically clear in Scripture that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always existed in their one God. But even in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters that God created. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit have always existed. And the weird thing is we generally, depending on the type of church or the type of background that you have, we treat it Father, Son, Holy Book. That's what we do. We make the Holy Spirit, the no offense, the red-headed stepchild. And we want nothing to do with the Holy Spirit because he freaks us out, and yet he's God. And so you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then verse 3, through him, being Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Everything was created through Jesus. Jesus was a part of the creation story in Genesis 1. He was there. And you need to understand, students. It's all about Jesus. Everything we say, everything we do, the fact that you were invited here, maybe you went to the root beer cake, or maybe you're just 
just walking along, maybe you're new to the school and you didn't know anyone, you just had these big eyes, and you're just like, man, I don't see anyone that's familiar. You walk past the Ruger Kager, you connect with someone, they invited you here. Do you know why they invited you here? Because they want you to know Jesus. They don't want you to continue in this life doing whatever you want. Like, I, I came to faith. How many of you are 20? I came to faith when I was your age. And when I grew up, I grew up not believing in a God, thought God was ridiculous, didn't want anything to do with him. See, my mom died when I was eight, and that made me a very pissed off person. And I wanted nothing to do with God. I didn't believe in him, but I hated him, and I don't believe in the Easter Bunny, but he doesn't seem to piss me off. And I spent all this time just arguing with annoying people called Christians, and I would point them towards the fact that if God's real, if he's loving, why does he let so many bad things happen? And I asked all these questions that most Christians I, I call them barnacle Christians, have never actually spent any time looking into to try to figure out how to answer. And yet the answers are there. It's in this book. It's apologetics. It's looking into the truth and the logic and the way who is Jesus. And so everything that we do is about Jesus. The reason that you're here, the reason that you're going to hear about these different ministries on campus, this one, and FCA, and Crew, and Ignite, is because they're about Jesus. They want you to know him. I want you to know that you can know him, but you can also be known by him. See, no other human being ever has been as well known as Jesus. No other person has been on more magazine covers. No, more per no other person's name has been said in more context. In fact, if you're getting up late, you're trying to go to your refrigerator, and you stub your toe, you don't yell out Justin Bieber, right? <laughs> you yell out Jesus. And unfortunately, we've turned his name into a cuss word, and yet he's the one true God. And he's done for you what you cannot do for yourself, and that's why he deserves worship. Not because you can do enough to earn your way to God, lest you be a jackass the rest of eternity. But so you can understand that you can have a relationship with God, and he has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. I can say jackasses. <laughs> Jesus also wants us to be active in the creation of all things. But kill myself. He isn't one of many choices. He isn't one of many 
that he is it. It's either you're with him or you're against him. So have you said yes to the one true Jesus? Or have you accepted a placebo version of him? One that you just attend church for, you raise your hands for, you sing love songs to, and you Instagram pictures of your Bible. Have you actually said yes to the one true Jesus who wants your entire life and not just a little bit of your religion? Hmm. Verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Another word for overcome is conquer. It has not conquered it. John uses the terminology of light throughout his Gospels consistently. The word is the light unto all men's feet to explain what it means to accept the truth of the Gospel, of the Bible, of what Jesus has come to say, his message, who he truly is. You are in the light. You have been enlightened to the truth, but so many people are in contrast where John explains that so many of us are in the darkness. See, when you're following Jesus, when you've said yes to the one true God, you are in the light, but according to John... When you're not following him, you are in the darkness, and the darkness, no matter how bad and evil you think this world is, will never, ever overcome the light. We're living in a messed up, cracked out time period. And there have been terrible things happening for centuries, but because of the internet, because of social media, we're starting to see all the crazy things that are happening in Iraq. We're starting to see the crazy stuff that's happening in parts of our country with racism. And we live in a terrible, terrible time, and yet the Darkness will never overcome the light. Because Jesus wins. I read ahead. And you should too. He wins. And so if he won, I want to be with him. If he wins, if he's Lord, if he's king, I want to be with him. Because when I'm about the king's business, I win. But so many of us choose the darkness and we don't even realize it. That's why so many of you have said yes to Jesus and you've started to follow him. But as you followed him, it's gotten a lot harder and as you've been following him, you're just going, man, Jesus is asking me to give up things I don't really want to give up. And so you're following him, but then he asks you about maybe your, maybe your relationships with the opposite sex. And you go, Jesus, I'm not really ready to give that up to you. And you stop walking behind him, and then you stop. And then he continues to walk forward. He's continuing to walk, and you're going, Jesus, you're walking a little too fast. You're asking me to give up things I'm not ready to give up. And so you're sitting there, and you let him keep walking, and then you realize... Man, I'm not going to be able to catch him. So you just get up and you turn back around and you start to live the way you used to live. And you walk away from Jesus. But then you realize that that life sucks. And you're like, well, this was cool, but like, I'm totally missing my Christian friends. And I kind of miss my relationship with Jesus. And so you start to spend time with God again. And then you start to follow him. And then you're doing it. And then he asks you to give something else up. And you're like, oh, man. And then you turn back around. And then you realize that sucks. And then you turn back to Jesus. And then you're starting to do this. You know what you are? You're a dizzy-ass Christian. That's what you are. And so God wants your heart because he loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to know him personally and follow him. And guess what? He's going to allow you to go through tough things. I lost my mom when I was eight. was a, a Christian antagonistic person. Or I was an antagonist against the Christians my entire high school and then into college. I got married to my best friend after I came to faith, and then we moved to a terrible town out by Modesto, right below hell, and we lived there for four years, and it was terrible, and I got addicted to porn, and I became a terrible husband and a terrible father as we had kids, and then God allowed us to move back to this area, and then I had to witness my three, or, uh, how old was she, two and a half years of age, my two and a half year old daughter have a 28 minute seizure in front of me, but God got my attention. And so I started to serve him when she snapped out of it like nothing ever happened. And then, guess what? Ten months later, my dad died without Jesus. And so life hasn't been easy. If anyone ever tells you that once you follow Jesus, life gets easy, they haven't read the Bible. Because every single person that's following Jesus in here, it pretty much doesn't end up very well for them in this life. But this isn't all we get. And we don't store up our treasures here. You're spending time in college you're, you're going to spend a Thursday evening here. Maybe you're going to do some other extracurricular Christian things. But it's not just about attending and consuming. It's about serving. It's about trusting Jesus and giving your life to this campus through the power of the Holy Spirit and allowing others to know how great he is. But some of us won't do that because we just want to consume. And life will just get a little bit harder. And then we'll just turn away and what will happen? Dizzy ass Christian. So I challenge you to not allow that to be how your year starts off because you have an identity in Christ. If you said yes to Christ, that means that you are a son, you are a daughter of the God Most High. But 
But a lot of us don't live in that royalty. We don't live in that luxury. We act as if we're still a servant and slave to sin. We don't have to. Verse 9. The true light, I skipped a few, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. See, the, go the gospel is that God created everything, and it was good. In fact, in Genesis 1, there is this rhythm that happens. He created this, and he created this, and he created this, and it was good. And it is this poem that is written in Hebrew. And then all of a sudden, in, in Genesis chapter 3, you've got Adam and Eve. God has said to Adam, do not eat from that tree. And then Adam stands like a passive idiot and allows Eve to eat from the tree. And now all of a sudden, there is sin that's come into the world. And there is a fracture that has happened. Why? Because they trusted themselves more than they trusted God. Have you ever been there? If you've ever trusted what you can accomplish more than what God can accomplish through you, I can guarantee you have. You want to know why? Because most of you do not keep the Sabbath. And the reason the Sabbath was put into place was to make you realize that you could do more in God's power in six days than you could do on your own in seven. And yet too many of us are afraid to rest because we have too many papers to figure out, to finish. We have too many tests to study for. Yet God told us to rest. But see, there was this sin that caused this fracture, and it created a broken lens. How many of you have glasses? So imagine a broken lens. Imagine walking through this life on broken lenses. How frustrating is that? But because of sin, that's what has happened. And there's been this broken lens that we've had to walk through, where we walk through a life full of pain, through evil, through suffering, and through Twilight movies. And we have to live this life <laughs> where stuff's just messed up. But even though the world is fractured, guess what? Because there's bad news, because of Christ, there's good news. And because of this good news of the gospel, that Jesus left the comforts of heaven where he was good. He came into our history. He walked among us. He lived a perfect life. He didn't try to get rid of the law. He fulfilled it for us. He lived the perfect life that none of us could live. How many of you have lost your keys? Your cell phone? Then you probably suck at being God. <laughs> and most of us attempt to be our own gods. And yet Jesus lived the perfect life proving that he was God and he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Lived the life we should have lived but couldn't. Died the death that we deserved to die but we don't have to because he did. He physically rose from the dead on the third day proving that his death and resurrection was enough so we could have a relationship with God, rose from the dead, showed himself to over 500 people over 40 days, ascended to heaven, and one day we believe, if you have a relationship with Jesus, that Christ is coming back. And we're expectant of that day. That's why we sing the songs that we sing. That's why many of us attend church on a Sunday morning or Saturday night. We do it to worship and celebrate the fact that we trust that our King is coming back. And that's good news. But if you don't have a relationship with God, if you don't know him, if you don't care about him, there's this great quote that says that if you don't want Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, living this life is the closest you'll ever be to heaven. But if you know Jesus, this is the closest you'll ever be to hell. And it's knowing him and having a relationship with him. Ultimately, at the end of your life, and I guarantee you're going to forget most of the stuff that I've said other than dizzy-ass Christian. <laughs> But the things that you may remember, and that I made fun of Twilight, but the thing that I want you to remember is this. That at the end of your life, the only question that's going to matter to be answered is this. Are you ready? White people, you can write this down. You ready? What did you do with Jesus? Was he a good teacher in your life? Was he your homeboy and you had that lame shirt? What was Jesus in your life? Was he Savior? He gave you death insurance so you didn't have to worry about death so you could just spend eternity with him? Or was he Lord and King of your life? Because what did you do with Jesus is the most important question you will ever have to answer when you stand before a holy and perfect Father. Verse 10. He, being Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Do you know that even though every single person in this room already has heard about Jesus and who he truly is, that this world, even the people walking past who can hear my voice, don't necessarily know who the one true Jesus is, who Christ really is? So many of them have bought into a placebo Jesus, 
one who isn't really God, but is one that they've painted and created in their own minds, to follow because they can keep him in their pocket and they can just pull him out when they need a genie in a bottle. But the one true Jesus, this world needs to know about. If you look around this room, if you look at the faces in this room, if God, by the power of the Spirit, grabs your heart and pointed you towards telling others about Jesus, this room could change all 36,000 students' lives on this campus. If each one of us would buy into the truth of the gospel. But a lot of us don't want to buy into it. We just want to kind of come and do the fun thing and just consume. And yet Jesus doesn't want you to be a consumer. He wants you to be a disciple. Each and every one of us wants to belong. Each and every one of us wants to matter. When this life ends, we want to feel like we accomplished something, that we had some type of stamp on this life, that our fingerprints were on this life, and yet so many of us try to fill this huge, God-shaped hole in our hearts with temporal things. Well, I love this video game, or I, I love these things, or I love this technology, or I love this relationship, and every single created thing at some point is either going to die or end up in a garage sale. And that's what we're trying to fill our lives with. Not the gospel, not the truth, not the word, not logic, not Jesus, but we're trying to fill it with things of this world that will eventually decay. As the only one who can fill that hole. And if you know him, he knows you. He loves you, and He cares for you, and He wants you to walk alongside Him. Verse 11, He came to, to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him. Have you ever not felt received? Have you ever not felt welcome in a place? Maybe you walked in here and no one talked to you, and it was a little weird. You were kind of like, why, why am I here? I, I feel like I'm supposed to be here, but why isn't anyone talking to me? And Paul still do that. Make sure that every person who walks through these doors it's loved on with the love of Christ. Yeah. Maybe you walk into a classroom and you sit in the back and no one comes and talks to you and you raise your hand and answer a question just to get some attention and the teacher doesn't call on you. Maybe you can spend an entire day on this campus, I believe this can happen, especially in the Silicon Valley, and you spend the entire day and you absolutely don't have any contact with any person. You're in a room full of people, but you never actually talk to someone. No one actually acknowledges you. See, what Jesus had wasn't just that. In a lot of cases, people didn't acknowledge him. That's what we're dealing with now. But in his time period, people acknowledged him and they hated him because he brought the light. And if you're a Christian on this campus, you're peculiar, the Bible says. Peculiar doesn't mean that you're just awkward. Peculiar means that you're set apart, that you're chosen. And so when you're a Christian, you're peculiar because you should look different than this world. I'm not saying you have to be weird and wear a shirt that says Sprite, or instead of Sprite, it says Spirit. Like, you don't have to be strange, but you should look different than this world because when the world looks at you, they should take notice of who you are and go, hey, what's different about you? And you should be prepared with an answer to share with them who Jesus Christ is because he's what changes us. He's what makes us peculiar because we have a relationship with the one true God and so many people because you hang out in a church or just because you come into a chapel doesn't make you a Christian. Because if I go into Taco Bell, that doesn't make me a taco, right? <laughs> so you realize that we're in need of a relationship. We're in need of getting to know one another. We're in need of getting to know each other's stories that is so incredibly important. And we start to live this life and there's something missing in it. We're wishing that there was just something more. Can I just be honest with you? I'm a little older than most of you. I've lived a little more life than most of you have. Can I just be honest with you? You will never find anything that isn't Jesus that will fulfill your life. Test me on it. Go nuts. Have fun. But I promise you, you will never find anything that will fulfill your life. No relationship. No created thing. I mean, I'm married. I have four beautiful children. I have a great life. And yet all of that is terrible at being God. Because only God can fulfill that God-shaped hole in your heart. See, a lot of us don't think we're that bad. A lot of us think that we're, actually, we're not that bad. We start to grade on a curve. The people that we know, we're like, well, I'm not as bad as that, dude. Like, he's still stable, right? Like, oh, he's terrible. And we start to grade on a curve, but really, what are we really going to do? I'm not as bad as Hitler. See, the thing is, God doesn't grade on a curve. And if he did, 
he would grade against Jesus. And none of us have walked on water. None of us have raised someone from the dead. None of us have done what Jesus Christ has done. And he did what he did for you, personally. Not for the person next to you only, but for you, personally. So own that. <coughs> own that Jesus died the death that you deserve to die. Even if you want nothing to do with him, own the fact that Christ died so you could have a relationship with him. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to receive it. But own the fact that it happened. And just know that as you hear that, it's kind of like taking the blue pill in the Matrix. Is that a reference too old? I don't even know. I saw it in high school, so it was a long time ago. But it's kind of like taking the blue pill. Because when you start to hear that Jesus actually died and rose again and it happened, a lot of us kind of want to pretend like it didn't happen, but it did. Keith figured that out. When him and I sat down, he kind of came at me like this cocky kid. And was like, well, how do you know Jesus is real? I'm like, because he rose from the dead. What are you going to do with that? He's like, how do you know? I walked him through it. I was like, huh. <laughs> he said, riddle me this, Batman. If Jesus rose from the dead, what are you going to do with him? Now, see, here's the thing. I could be Batman because you've never seen me and Batman in the same room. What up? <laughs> Verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, we can hear the gospel a lot. In fact, some of you have spent a lot of time in the church. You've heard the gospel so much that you've been desensitized to the truth. Meaning, you've heard about it on Christmas. You've heard about it on Easter. If it's a, if it's a pretty contemporary church that's serious about people getting saved, then you've heard it a lot. Jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself. He died on the cross. Too many of us leave him in the damn grave, but he didn't stay in the grave because my God's alive, but he rose from the dead. And we hear that all the time, and it just starts to become noise. And yet if Jesus did all of that, it's the power of God. And it means that we can be saved, that we can have a relationship with God. But you have to do something with the truth. And here's what I can guarantee. In this room full of people, there are people that were dragged here, and they're like, why have I not left yet? There are people in this room that have spent their entire lives in church, and there are people in this room that are chasing after Jesus. And in the three camps of those three, you still haven't really understood the gospel necessarily. Even if you are running after Jesus, maybe you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Maybe you're not doing it because he loves you. You're doing it because you're still trying to earn your way to him. That's ridiculous. See, having a relationship with Jesus, receiving his grace, is like going to a building where you're trying to break into the house of God through metal bars in the window, and when Jesus' death and resurrection happened, he unlocked the door and he left it open so you can just walk in. But you're still trying to break in through windows and bars. So if you would humble yourself, if you would submit yourself to the truth of the gospel, I can guarantee you this, your life will change. Because no one experiences Christ. No one starts a relationship with Jesus and doesn't change. It is impossible. So what are you going to do with this truth? It says that if you, verse 12, yet to all who did receive him. So you have to do something with the news. Not just believe in it, but receive it. Not to just intellectually accept it. Yeah, I believe that happened. But you've received it and it's changed your life. Has it changed your life? Students. Have you allowed the gospel to penetrate your heart and change you from the inside out? Because if you haven't, I can almost guarantee you will receive the placebo of Jesus, not the real one. Have you believed in his name? Not just intellectually accepted it, but does Jesus, the name, mean something to you? When you stand before God, are you going to give him your, your attendance sheet at church? Or are you going to stand with Jesus? Because of what he's done and what he's accomplished. Is Jesus just a good teacher in your life? Do you consider him a great prophet? Or is he Lord? Do you treat him as a good idea, good advice, or as the good news that's transformed your life? Who's Jesus? He says that we then get the right to become children of God. And what I don't want you guys to miss this school year, I am so honored to preach the first week. I don't want you to miss this. That if you say yes to Jesus, for real, if you've already done it, if you decide to do it tonight, if you do it this school year, if you say yes to Jesus, you are no longer an enemy of God's. 
You're a son or daughter of God's. And that's amazing. Because I know all the junk that I've done. Like, I know the bad stuff that I've done. I know the terrible stuff that I've thought. Anyone? Anyone want me to find out what you've thought the last 24 hours and put it on the screen? Anybody? Probably not. And yet God looks at all the things that you've done, all the things that you've said, all the things that you've done, all the things that you will do, and he goes, I love you perfectly right now. That's our God. That's the one who brings you into your, his family. I have three daughters and I have a son. I want an only son. I like to say that way. So, no. so, but I have these three beautiful daughters, and they like to test the boundaries all the time. So it's like, Evie, don't step over that line. So what she do? She steps on it. Such a sinner. And I tell her not to do these things, but she's constantly pushing the boundaries. But when she fails, do I kick her out of the family? Hell to the no. She's mine. She's my daughter. And Spartans, what you need to understand is, when you say yes to Jesus, you're going to screw up, but you're his son. You're his daughter. The only way to disappoint God is to not receive him. The only way to not be in right relationship with Jesus is to not receive him and to not trust him with your life and not allow him to lead you. Verse 13 Children born not of natural descent. So he explains that you must receive him, and then you become a daughter or son of the God Most High if you believe in his name. Children born not of natural descent. You cannot get your salvation from your parents. There's no grandchildren in the faith. It does not work that way. You cannot be brought into the faith because your parents went to church. You have to receive it yourself. Nor of human decision. What? See, what I'm going to do in a few moments, I just want to be clear. I'm going to ask Jordan to come up here. He's going to help me sound spiritual. He's going to play the guitar. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And while he does that, I'm going to talk a little bit louder, and I'm going to sound a little more emotional, and I'm going to point you towards Jesus. And I'm going to say, if you want to have a relationship with God, here's what you do. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to pray through a prayer, and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you've trusted Jesus. You know what's crazy about that? You didn't decide that. He did. So you can fight it all you want. Go nuts. I need you, Jesus. I tried that. I'm a pastor. <laughs> but if you, if God is doing something in you, he's going to woo you. You know what's really frustrating about hearing the truth? That you'll leave this place, and then you'll find out the people that you thought were totally cool turned out to be Christians. And you're like, How? why? And what God does is you, he starts to just get into your peripherals. And everywhere you go, you just kind of you hear like the fray. And you're like, oh, it's a Christian song. You know, like, you, just, you don't know what to do with that. But God gets in your peripherals. Basically, he's like a guy trying to mack on a girl, liking pictures on her Facebook. God gets in your peripherals. Don't tweet that, by the way. <laughs> God wants to be in your peripherals, and he's going to woo you to himself. And so it is not by natural descent. You can't be born into the faith, nor of human decision or a husband's will. No one can force you to be a Christian. You've got to receive it. But born of God. So when you say yes to Jesus, when you start a relationship with him, you are born of God. I don't know any better news. I don't know any better news than to be a son or daughter of the God Most High who's perfect, who's done for me what I could not do for myself. Do you want to understand if, you, if you're starting to understand the gospel? It's simple. Does the gospel sound too good to be true? If it sounds too good to be true, you're starting to understand it. Here's the great news. It is true. But it sounds so good, it almost sounds too good. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. So here's what we're going to do. Verse 14, band, come on up. They're going to walk behind me. They're going to play music. It's going to get all emotional and all of that. I don't want you to miss what I'm saying. Verse 14, the word became flesh, Jesus, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, Full of grace and truth. See, I hate when people try to just tell people truth without any grace. Because when I go and share truth with you and I don't have any grace, it's not truth at all. And when you try to share grace but there's no truth attached, it's not grace at all. 
See, Jesus wasn't 50% truth and 50% grace. He was 100% truth and 100% grace. Deal with that, those of you who understand that. And Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he made his dwelling among us and he lived and the life that we should have lived and he died the death that we should have died. And when you receive that, you are known by him. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 says, But whoever loves God is known by God. It's great news. That you can not just know God yourself, but he can know you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows what you're going to do. He knows the best things for you. And you can have a relationship with that God. And the other good news is that once he saves you, once he brings you into relationship with him, once your identity can be found in Jesus and what Christ has done, he puts you in his church. I don't know how you see church. I don't know if church just seems terrible and you just walk into a room and you sing some love songs to Jesus and you stand up, sit down, stand up, and you leave. I don't know how you see church, but church biblically is Christ's bride. And Christ laid down his life for his bride. I've laid down my life for my bride. And when you get married, you'll lay down your lives for your bride. And when you say yes to Jesus, you get brought into the church, which is his bride. So in a few moments, I'm going to tell you how you can respond and what you can do. But I don't care if you respond today or if you responded years ago and you had a relationship with Jesus. Know that this ministry is an opportunity for you to be a part of God's church. To connect with other believers who will walk alongside you and love on you and care for you. And when that happens, it glorifies our Father. See, I have these kids that are beautiful and I love them, but you know what the most annoying sound is ever? Not the sound from down the number. You know what the most annoying sound ever is? It's when my kids fight. There's this like Old Testament wrath that wants to come out of me on them. I'm just like, you do not yell at my dog. You know, like I just, right? And I feel like God feels the same way about his kids. He doesn't want his kids fighting. He wants his kids loving one another because we're a part of his bride. So what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to accept this wonderful gift of salvation that he offers you? Or are you going to try to live life on your own? Are you going to try to break into the house of God through the window? Or are you just going to go through that door that's been unlocked and left open because Jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself? Here's what we're going to do. Would you just close your eyes? You just bow your heads. I want you to hear the story. Some of you have heard me tell it before, but it's important that we hear it and we apply it and we understand it. Years ago, a man worked at a drawbridge. He took his only son with him to the drawbridge, and what would happen is he'd go to the drawbridge, and boats would come down the river, and as they'd come down the river, He would have to go and press a button and stop signs would go onto the bridge and then he'd pull a lever down and the bridge would go up so the boats could go underneath the bridge without crashing into it. One day he's at work, his son's with him and the light goes on the little board and he realizes he has to go press the stop signs. He presses the button and the stop signs come down and cars stop going over the bridge. Can you see the bridge? Can you see the river? And he presses the button and the stop signs go down and he goes to grab the lever and down the river he sees a party boat. And that party boat coming down the river is just having a great time. They listen to music, they're all on the roof of the boat, they're partying it up, booze cruise, it's a blast. And all of a sudden as the conductor, the guy leading or running the drawbridge grabs the lever, he goes to pull the lever down and as he does he hears the worst shriek he's ever heard in his life. It was in that moment he realized that he had left his son down by the gears. And when he pulled the lever, the gears started to move and they grabbed his son's legs and they were crushing his son's legs. Now in this moment, in this time, can you see this? Can you see the panic on his father's face? He has his hand on the lever and he has two choices. He can push it back up and go and try to save his son. Or he can pull it down and he can destroy his son and the drawbridge can go up so the people on this boat can safely go underneath. He's only got a moment to think about it, and in that moment, he decides to pull down the lever 
and destroy his one and only son. The drawbridge goes up, the party boat comes down the river, and as it goes underneath the bridge, they're dancing, having a blast, having no idea of the sacrifice that was just made so that they could live. Maybe some of you didn't realize the sacrifice that was made for you before you walked into this place. I can guarantee there are people walking past this chapel that don't realize the sacrifice that was made for them so that they could live the life that they're living. So with everyone's heads bowed, everyone's eyes closed, I just want to give you an opportunity to know this Jesus, to say yes to him, to accept this free gift. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I would just encourage you to pray. You can just pray where you're sitting. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You don't have to pray it out loud. You can just pray it under your breath, in your heart. But I just talk to God. I just say, Father, Daddy, thank you. Thank you that you sent Jesus to live the life that I could not live. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross, the death that I should have died. Thank you, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead, proving he is who he says he is. God, I don't want to be a dizzy Christian. I want to change direction. I want to repent. I want to give up this life of sin. I know I'm not going to do it perfectly. But I want to change direction. And you, by the power of your spirit, would you lead me from this day forward? For some of you, you don't realize this, but in this moment, you went from death to life. You started a relationship with the one true God. You don't know this, but there are angels in heaven partying, having a blast, because your heart has gone from death to life. See, that's what God does in a cosmic second, by your willingness to humble yourself underneath the power and the grace of Jesus. So with everyone's heads bowed, everyone's eyes closed, nothing to be ashamed of, maybe tonight was the night that you said, at the start of this school year, I'm going to make my life about Jesus, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to trust him with everything. So if you decide to do that tonight, for real, not faking it, not kind of, but if you mean it, everyone's heads bowed, everyone's eyes closed, would you just raise up your hand so I can pray for you? You just raise up your hand. Praise God. Praise God. Any others? Nothing to be ashamed of. Proud of you guys. Praise God. Hallelujah. Put them down. For some of you Christians, you've been living life, you went through the summer, and you've just kind of been living it the way that you want, and even though you have a relationship with God, you've been acting like you don't. Maybe you just need to be prayed for tonight. So if you are in that place where you just need to repent, and you want to tell God, hey, I love you, and you just want to be prayed for, would you just raise your hand? Let me pray for you. Amen. Proud of you guys. Proud of you guys. Nothing to be ashamed of. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for these young men and women. I thank you so much for those Christians who have said that they need to repent. There's nothing to be ashamed of. God, when we repent, we have another opportunity to be intimate with you. And so, God, I pray that you would lead them and allow them to be disciples of yours, especially this school year, where they would make much of Jesus on this campus. And Father, I pray for the young men and women tonight who have said, I want to go from death to life. I want this Jesus. God, I thank you that you are a rescuing God. Thank you that you loved us in spite of us. So God, for those of them who have said yes to you tonight, God, I pray that it would be experiential and intellectual and emotional, that they would feel the heart change that comes from trusting in you with their life. God, as we worship in these next few songs, I just ask that we would allow you to minister to us, that we would sing to our Heavenly Father, we would sing to our Daddy, and God, I ask for those that have made a decision tonight to make sure that they let others know. There's no secret agent Christians. There's no 007 Christians. Allow them to fill out a card or send an email to one of the leaders or a Facebook me and just let us know that you've said yes to Jesus. Because we want to give you next steps. We praise you, Jesus, in your precious name.